Grace, peace, and mercy from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. Do you believe there's no room for evil in good? Are good and evil really direct opposites? For all practical purposes, does it make sense to reject completely those philosophies of the yin and yang that suggests good needs evil in order to help what is righteous express itself. I saw a post on social media sharing a quote from Francis Bacon. In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Does God's love really need to depend on its dark counterpart in order to be expressed? Some will defend the notion that a practical compromise of the good and the bad is inevitable. It's just part of life. We have to survive out in the world. Not every big business transaction is cut and dry. I remember when I was in college, when I was taking my accounting courses, it was a gray area. Remember that many times, the gray areas. Sometimes the gray areas got really black, depending on the accountant. Isn't there wiggle room? When it comes to doing the right thing, the Apostle Paul tells us, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So evil not only has no place in good, but good is what completely overcomes evil. The Apostle Paul says that which is truly virtuous, actually dispels evil, its opposition. And this is grounded in love, God's love and God's goodness. I found this quote, um, said it was from George Bernard Shaw. A Native American elder once described his own inner struggles in this manner. Inside of me, there are two dogs. One of the dogs is mean and evil. The other dog is good. The mean dog fights the good dog all the time. When asked which dog wins, he reflected for a moment and replied, the one I feed the most. If you could put God's love in a bottle, the prescription would probably read, take as needed. But then I was writing this, I was, as I was writing this, I was like, no, scratch that out. Take it all the time, 24-7. We got to look out. This love may be more than we can handle. It may cause you to come face to face with a selflessness and personal sacrifice you're not willing to contemplate. Paul's not speaking of romantic love, sexual love, a love for pizza. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about the 60s love. He speaks of the divine love that his fellow apostle John wrote as a being God himself. For God is love, 1 John 4, 8. God's love has characteristics that go beyond your ideas of fairness and security. It involves a sacrifice of your flesh, sinful flesh, never wants to make in its pursuit of self-preservation. So our, our 
willing, when we want to survive, we're at conflict to that love. It's our human nature. Paul first speaks about what this love looks like within the Christian fellowship, the church. The love that dispels evil. That which prevents broken relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ. And in their, in their place solidifies and promotes the union we share in Christ. when we can be so disgusted with evil and hold fast to what is good. A selfless humility is in play. And this causes one to see it as a privilege to honor one another above yourself. Knowing that this is precisely what Christ has done for us, bringing about our salvation, this is God's love. Now, obviously, we see this in the world right now, right? <laughs> I say that with humor because it seems like everything's the wheels are coming off the wagon. <laughs> but the wheels have been coming off the wagon for since Adam and Eve fell into sin. We know that love often isn't us. We know how we look alongside at our, we look alongside, kind of cross-eyed at fellow believers. And we wonder, how in the world can you take that position? Whether it's at a voters meeting or something else. And then at 10.30 in the morning, we smile and everything's fine. Say a pleasant good morning. But then at noon, that changes. To maybe saying something not so nice that the person or persons might not ever hear. Or maybe, it's, or maybe it's your pastor that's the topic. Who knows? Trust me, I don't have little microphones in your houses. <laughs> but our sinful flesh causes us that turmoil. In verse 9, let love be genuine. We know, you know, even, even when we want to love our fellow members, our fellow Christians, we don't quite push hard enough because, hey, busy schedules, I've got, I've got stuff to do, it slips to mind. But St. Paul says, be fervent in spirit. But this love does exist within the family. This love is between you and me, brothers and sisters in Christ, who have been made aware of this love through the gospel. This love is how Christ has loved you. Genuinely, fervently, honoring you above all, above himself. The Son of God honoring you above himself never actually thought of that those words honoring you above himself 
that he would go to the cross. And then your words and actions reflecting this attitude do become a witness, an encouragement, as we call one another together in a family in faith, bearing one another's burdens. And you probably thought, okay, I'll quit here. Wrong. (laughs) Paul takes a giant step further and tells us what this Christian love does with those outside the faith. And then you got another wrinkle in there. Outside of the fellowship faith are those who do not know the love of God. They do not see evil and good as polar opposites. Therefore, they might not choose to treat you in the same way as we are called within the church to treat each other in response to our faith. In fact, you should expect not to get treated very well from non-believers. Of course, then your first response might be, I'm off the hook. Because if they're not in tune with type of love, what does it matter if I treat them with hostility? And if push comes to shove, I have the right and justification to avoid them or strike back. And claim a revenge when this love is not returned to me. It's kind of our human nature. After all, you reap what you sow, right? Sounds reasonable. But Paul tells us, bless those who persecute you. Repay no evil for evil. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in a, in a quick moment, you're like, what? This person's attacking me? And you want me to feed him? <laughs> That's not fair. And you're right, it's not fair. But you know what it is? Love. Love does not seek fairness. You guys have a lot more years of marriage than I do. So I think this, you know this is true. Love is not always fair. And I think, and I hope you know what I mean by that. Because otherwise you wouldn't be married for so many years. (laughs) You've got that figured out. (laughs) Love does not seek fairness. This is the love that is God. It is the love that saved you and would also be the persecutor without it. Christ's love did not seek fairness. It wasn't even considered. In 1 Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind. It, isn't, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. This is the very love demonstrated in the person of Christ. The action of responding to evil with good is 
is what will heap burning coals on your perceived enemy's head. The metaphor explains the thrust of everything Paul is saying. Repaying evil with good is so opposite of human retaliation. And instead is a divine response that brings a sense of shame and a change of mind that renders power, powerless the evil of the persecutor. How are you going to respond to that? <laughs> How is someone going to respond when they're being evil to you and all you're doing is loving them and being good? Do you know that many Muslims who have come to the Christian faith do you know why a lot of them have come to the Christian faith? Because the first time in their lives they have experienced the Christian love. That they never ever received it. And they received it from a Christian. a lot of them all they've experienced is the judgmental the law no gospel the good news is this is the love that Christ bestows to you this love forgives you for your failure to return good for evil That's the one thing we have to understand. Jesus died for our sins. And our faith in him, we have eternal life. Not our faith in him if we're good enough, because we're not. But our faith in him. The goodness is our response. But our response does not, we are not justified by our response. We are justified because of Christ, on account of Christ, on account of his sacrifice. And that is love. That is love for his people. And he has that love for the whole world that they would come to him because his yoke is easy. It is the same love that is Jesus' very character and why he responded to the persecution of the world by staying on the cross. He could have came off the cross. He's God. But he allowed the evil to destroy him, resulting in our atonement, providing forgiveness. This is how God crushed evil with virtue. The good that is love. The good that resurrects the Christ. The good that is God. There is no room for evil in good. The Christ has settled this once and for all. Amen.